Welcome to Toot Your Own Horn, Music Matters. Today, I am so lucky to have Bob Spring as a guest. Welcome, Bob. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you very much. It is such a treat to, to get to know you better from the beginning of your days learning to play the clarinet. Would you be so <laughs> kind as to tell us your story? Sure. So, uh, first of all, thanks again for letting me do this. When I was a little boy, um, we had an old story on cleric piano at home, and I used to go listen to like commercials on TV and then I would go pluck out the commercials on the piano. And my mom said, Oh, this is pretty cool. And I had forgotten about that until she and I were talking and she said, yeah, you used to do that. <laughs> and, and so one day my, my grandmother thought, well, maybe, maybe Bobby has some talent. So she, they sent me to the only piano teacher in town. I was four. And so I started playing for her and it, it was, uh, I had a good time about the first year and then things got weird and she would hit my hand with a ruler and stuff. And so I stayed with her for a long time, but I, I didn't like it anymore. It was really kind of depressing. So when I was in fifth grade, they said, well, we're going to start an orchestra. So I started playing violin and that was fun. I enjoyed it for fifth and sixth grade. But then in seventh grade, between sixth and seventh grade, we went from, uh, from, you know, the elementary school to the junior high school and, we got to go to the junior high for a tour. And while we were touring on this junior high, uh, we went to see the band. And I thought that was the most amazing sound I'd ever heard in my life. It was just this gorgeous sound. I can even remember what they were playing. They were playing a watered-down version of Americans' We. That's oh. how much of an impact it had on me. Oh, and, I, and in the house, my dad was a, was a, was a businessman, but he was an amateur clarinet saxophone player and he kind of put himself through school by playing in, in a dance band in the 40s you know and that kind of stuff so um we had this old clarinet at home and it was old an old leblanc clarinet with a white mouthpiece and and i thought that was going to be my clarinet and i was so excited about it and then just beforehand i they said we got you a new clarinet and i, I was actually disappointed because i liked the white mouthpiece but they they went to a, a music store in town called grinnell brothers and they rented for me an old con, con plastic clarinet. And and I was so excited about playing this clarinet, just really excited about playing it, and I just wouldn't put it down. In fact, I was kind of an idiot about it. Uh, it I set it on the floor in junior high band, and somebody kicked it over. I didn't know you had to have a peg. And it broke in half. So I still have that clarinet, but they glued the tenon on. Oh. back on. <laughs> Acoustically, it's an absolute wreck. But it, it, did, it did work for me at that time. And... Uh, I really loved it, and I played through junior high school. And at the end of junior high school, the, this was in, in 68, and things were getting pretty wild in the in the United States, and I grew my hair long and everything. And, and the band director really had a problem with me. And I'd always been first chair. And on the very last week of junior high band, he said, okay, we're going to have auditions on this piece. And he just handed out this piece, and he moved me down to fifth chair. And it was his way of, of just kind of shafting me. So then to get into the high school band, uh, the, the, the high school band director um, listened to what he said, and he, he said, well, I don't want you in my band. And the only way he would let me into high school band was if I went to summer school and studied clarinet with him in summer school. And he was a, he was a trumpet player. It was just I don't understand what happened. But in any event, I got in the high school band, but he told me, this is my favorite line, you're not good enough to play clarinet, but we'll put you on bass clarinet. And so, so I played this old LeBlanc bass clarinet, and I remember I had one of those necks that came straight in. And I, on my own, I didn't have any lessons. On my own, I figured out, you know, if I put it under the chair, it would it would come in a better angle, and I could play more notes, and I could get higher and stuff. And until he yelled at me and told me, no, I had to put it out in front of me, and then my head was tipped back like that. It was anyway. So I played in high school band, and then as a junior in high school, I uh, I. I decided that I, I I really wanted to be a music major. <clears throat> and my dad tried to talk me out of it. I mean, he was really a big business person. And he, at that point, teachers were having, well, they're all having, always having a hard time, but really having a hard time in Michigan. Um, the economy was going south. That was when automobiles started to move to, to production elsewhere, elsewhere. And so he, uh, he, tried to talk me out of it, and then I said, no, I really wanted to do this. So I went out, and I, I heard that, that it would be really good if I had a clarinet made out of wood. 
So I started mowing yards, and for $125, um, I went to a, a music store in Coldwater, Michigan, and I bought a Selmer Signet with an HS Star mouthpiece. Oh and Those yeah, were pretty oh good, though. <laughs> yeah, well, the HS Star would, would pierce steel, but yes. the Signet was not a bad clinic. Right. So I, at that point, I, st I went to a local music store and I found some some pieces of back when music stores had huge categories, you know, for solo right. ensemble festival and whatever. And I went and found a, a piece that I really liked, the, the Weber Grand Duo Concertant. Mm -hmm. And so I, it was way above my head. But anyway, I started practicing it. And then my dad said, well, uh, what do we need to do if you want to be a music major? And I said, well, I don't know. Well, he called the University of Michigan and we lived about 45 minutes away mm -hmm. and he started talking to the, one of the clarinet teachers there who happened to be John Moeller. Mm -hmm. And John said, well, has he ever had any lessons? And my dad said, no, not really. And he said, well, you better have him come play for me. So the next Saturday I drove to Ann Arbor and I went and I played for him and I played for about, Oh gosh, probably 30 seconds. And he stopped me and he said, well, you're not very good. And, and, and a couple of things happened. First of all, I didn't know how to say Weber Grand Duo Concertante. So I said the Weber Grand Duo Concertante. And so I, I didn't know any of this stuff. So I, I, we started, I said, well, I really want to be a music major. And he said, I'm not sure about this. He said, but I, he gave me a week. And he said, okay, I want you to go downtown to Hadcock uh, Music Company. That was Pete Hadcock's father who owned this music store downtown Ann Arbor. And, and get the Behrman Book 3. So he called ahead and they had the Behrman Book 3 waiting for me. And I don't remember how much it was, you know, probably a dollar ninety-five or something. And and so I bought it and I got home. And he told me he just wanted me to play C major at sixty. Well, first of all, I already knew that it was the only scale I knew anyway. And and then he said I, I had no idea what sixty was. I and so I didn't know what a metronome was. I had no idea that my piano teacher didn't believe in metronomes, and the the music teacher, the band teacher, they they never talked about that. So I. I came back the next week, and obviously I had, had no idea what I was doing. And, and he said, look, this is not working. I, 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 I don't think this is a good idea. Well, I actually started to cry. And, 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 and I, I said, but I, I want to be a music major. And he said, you're just too far behind. And I said, well, teach me. Promise, I promise you I'll do everything you tell me. Well, he spent the next 45 minutes with me just like showing me everything that he needed to show me about how to practice, where to buy a metronome, uh, what the metronome meant. It, they, I started out with one of those Seth Thomas wind-up things, and then I finally got a Franz electric one. But he he was showed me everything, and he showed me how to practice. And he told me you know, different reads, different mouthpieces. And that was the day that he opened his cabinet, and he said, one of my students is trying to sell a buffet clarinet. She's leaving music, and I'd like you to consider it. And the serial number, I can still remember, was 98174. And she wanted $250 for it. So <clears throat> my dad figured out how to get $250 and we bought the clarinet. And then I took it to this guy in Lansing because it needed some work. It was Bob Scott. And he said, I I'd like you, to, I'd, I'd like you to work this, make it work better. And by the time I got it back, I thought it was amazing. And that was that lesson where he took all that time with me was the last unprepared lesson I ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, from that point on, I just loved John and he was like a second father to me. In fact, we laughed because at, at band concerts when I was at Michigan, all the music faculty came. They all sat in the back, and you knew you screwed up if you had a lesson on Monday, and they, you walked in, and they were going like this, you know. And then, it, but my dad always sat next to John Moeller, and this is back before there were these purple laws and all this stuff. And he and John talked all the time, and they actually became good friends. My mom and John, and and and, uh, and it's funny because when I got married to Lynette, uh, John came to the wedding. And and he he never came to anybody's weddings, but he came to mine. And he he this is off, but I'll get back on that. He 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 bought us a blender. Now the, the good thing about this blender was John didn't drink, and he was always preaching about the evils of alcohol. And he didn't drink. So one time we decided to put rum in there to make some daiquiris, and it burned out. <laughs> it never works again. <laughs> Seriously, that's hysterical. John said, "Yeah, I told you about the evils." So anyway, um. I, the first year we had band auditions, uh, everybody had to play in a marching band at Michigan. And we had band auditions, and there were probably 50, 60 clarinets auditioned. And it had to be 60 because I, w I was chair 55. I mean, I was way on the bottom. I, I just didn't know anything. And I went to John 
And I, and I said, Dr. Muller, I'm really disappointed. I don't know what, what am I doing? How can I get better? And he set, helped me set up a, a practice schedule. So every morning I'd get up and I'd go down to the school of music at 7.30, you know, brush my teeth and go down and practice an hour. Then I'd come back and take a shower and get cleaned up and go to class. And the, the cool thing about 7.30 in the morning was that the cool kids weren't there yet. So there was nobody to hear how bad I was. And then in the middle of the afternoon, I'd come back again during orchestra because the cool kids were in orchestra and practice again. And then at the end of the day, I'd do my homework and everything, and I'd go down and practice a third time. So I was practicing about three hours every day. And and uh, so we, we had auditions the second year for marching band, and, and I, I was first chair. And all these people looked at me, and, and, and they said, where did you come from? What school did you transfer from? And they'd never seen me. I was so far in the back. So after that, I, I just kept going, and I, and I just loved playing the clarinet. To me, it was... I don't know. It was. It was. My, my wife thinks I'm addicted to practicing, which is entirely possible because I, I am. I for me, it's my my time, my alone time. And I think a lot of that comes from my four brothers. And when I was growing up, the only time I could be alone was when I was practicing because they were told to leave me alone. And my dad even built a practice room in the basement for me, so so it was <clears throat> my alone time. And I think still today, that's that's how I feel about it. Even. When my daughter was growing up, when I was practicing, nobody bothered me. It was always kind of a thing like that. Well, the next year I won concertos as a, as a junior and then graduated with a music ed degree. And then the funny thing about that was that as a music ed student, you weren't allowed to do senior recitals. And so I had won concertos the year before and played Copeland by memory of the orchestra, but they wouldn't let me do a senior recital. So John went and petitioned it and we did it and it was great. And then I, I went and did my master's degree after that. And uh, John had gone on sabbatical, and Dave Schifrin was teaching there. And so I, I studied with Dave Schifrin for a year. And the master's degree at Michigan was just a year-long degree at that point. And so I, I, I went through it. And then I thought I was going to take the world by storm. So I would practiced all these excerpts and all this stuff. And I, and I went and auditioned for the New Jersey Symphony. And I thought, wow, this is going to be cool. And I walked in, and there were 275 other people that were auditioning for the New Jersey Symphony, all playing Capriccio Espanol at about 120 decibels and at about 240. You know, it was just... And so I, after going through that experience, obviously I didn't get the job. <laughs> after going through that experience, I thought, I, I don't want to go this route. So I went back home and I, I taught junior high band for a year. And, and and it was fun. Actually, it was it was really good because I learned so much about organization. Uh, like, first of all, I wanted to keep playing. And so I would get to school an hour before the kids came in in the morning and I would stay an hour after they left at night and then I would practice at home. So it was the, the whole thing was I was able to, to keep going. And then, then the next year, this was in 79 and, and jobs were, were not readily available. I mean, it was kind of a recession and uh, the jobs were different back then. I mean, they're, they're kind of that way again now, but it was clarinet and, you know, and so I was actually hired at, at Morningside College, which is now Morningside University in Sioux City, Iowa, as the marching band director. And those four years of marching band at Michigan actually paid off because they got me a job that also taught clarinet. <clears throat> so I got there and they told me it's it like a you know big marching band and all this stuff. Well, it wasn't. There were like 48 people or 38. I mean, it was, it was terrible. So I had to recruit like crazy. So I spent six years at Morningside College, and a lot of it was learning how to recruit a lot of it was getting along with the other faculty, learning how to organize as a band director. And the recruiting paid off because in the end, I had a, a huge group of clarinets and I taught saxophone too. So a huge group of clarinet saxophonists. And so then a job opened at uh, West Texas State University, which is now West Texas A&M University. During the time I was at Morningside, you know, it, I always joked about Sioux City. It's not the edge of the earth, but you can see it from there. And so I was... I, I played second clarinet sometimes in the orchestra, but they had a community person who played, you know, principal in the orchestra. So I really, anything I did, I had to create on my own. So all of a sudden, I started getting involved in new music. There was this guy who owned a music store in South Sioux City, Nebraska. His name was Jay Wicker. And, and it was Jay's music. And Jay specialized, you know, in band music and choir music. But he had a whole room full of solos primarily aimed at kids that wanted to go to solo and ensemble contests, and these solos were on the list, the approved list. But he told me once when I went over there 
that in order to get the music that he wanted at a at the price that he needed to make a profit, that he had to buy new music. And so he, he said, you know, are you interested in new music? I said, yeah, yeah. So he used to put it all in a Coors beer box, big Coors beer box, and called it on the side he wrote in Magic Marker, Bob's Bin. And he would throw music in there, and when he got enough in there, he'd call me and he'd say, come on over. So I'd go over and look. And while I was there, I found some incredible pieces that changed my life. And and one of them was Joan Tower's Wings. And, and it was just sitting in there. And, and I bought that, and I started working on it, and eventually I recorded it when I got here. And then and then I uh, I went to, uh, they had another piece by Morton Sabotnik called Passages of the Beast. And it's for clarinet and, and electronics, but he called it Ghost Box. And it was actually commissioned by the old International Clarinet Society. And, and, and it's 18 minutes long, and at the end of the piece, there are 16th notes at 184 that have to be articulated. And I, I, I couldn't figure out how to do that. So that's when I learned a double tone. And then I actually played it for Mort, and, and he, he, I was circular breathing in sections then too. And boy, he, it was crazy. And that opened a whole lot of doors for me. So that time in Iowa, just learning new music and learning stuff that, because I was alone. I mean, there was a pianist that I could work with occasionally, but most of what I had to do was on my own. And I did whole recitals of unaccompanied clarinet music. I probably bored the heck out of everybody there, but they seemed to enjoy it. So then this job opened at West Texas State. And this was in, uh, 1985, and, and I, I, a colleague of mine at Morningside College had gone to school there, and he recommended that I apply. And I applied, and I don't know how, but I got an, I got an interview. I mean, I'm not a Texan. I, I, I wasn't actually their first choice at the beginning. <laughs> and so I, I went, and I, and I did the interview and the audition. And it went pretty well, but there were some, some things I learned from the interview that were really, there was, there was a guy there who played for me, and and he was kind of a smart aleck, and, and he uh, he kept squeaking when he was going to the uh, clarinet E flat. He kept squeaking every time. And I said, so, Jim, why are you squeaking there? And he looked at me and said, I don't know. You tell me you're supposed to be the teacher. And, and I said, well, you don't, if you see me one hour a week and you're practicing two hours a day, who's your teacher the other four, 14 hours? And he just looked at me, and, the, and the, the faculty were really, they thought, wow, that was a great answer. Turns out what he was doing was he was hitting the side E-flat, B-flat key right. when he came down every time. So when I told him that, he said, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> and, and But I taught there for three years. And 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 I, I finished my doctorate during that period of time. <laughs> and I uh, actually started it when I was living in Iowa. And I, I, I went back and got it with John Moeller at Michigan because at that point he was producing so many students in college job situations, and that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I finished my doctorate while we were there, and this job opened at, at Arizona State. Now, the other thing that happened was, again, uh, I had some of the opportunities were not... When I moved there, I was promised that I would I would be playing with a, a quintet, the West Texas State quintet, and I'd be playing principal clarinet in the Emerald Symphony. Well, when I moved there, the guy who was playing principal in the Amarillo Symphony refused to quit. And it was a separate job, and it was nobody. And then the quintet didn't happen. So I had to create another time. I had to create my own performance life. So the percussion teacher there, Susan Martin, was she, one day she said to me, are you interested in doing a recital together? So all of a sudden, I got this whole repertoire of clarinet and percussion music that actually then paid off when I came to Arizona State for 33 years, J.B. Smith and I played together, and it was remarkable. We had such a good time. Um, so I, I interviewed at, at, at ASU. I applied for it late. John Moeller sent me the, the, the job notice, and I applied for it. And and I, it was right like the day before the deadline. And the only other reason I applied was the chair of the committee called me and said, you've been recommended by Bob Reynolds and John Moeller. Why haven't you applied? Well, in the meantime, I'd heard the job was rigged and they had somebody in mind. So I said, well, I heard the job was rigged. And the chair of the committee just went indignant. He said it was not rigged. So I applied and they asked me to interview. But the, the funny part about that was I wasn't supposed to get the job. Somebody else was supposed to get the job. I got there and, and it was a, a really weird interview, really very strange interview. And I prepared a whole bunch of music. I, I they, they had a, a, it had to be a 25 minute or 30 minute audition 
And not only did they want some like Brahms or something like that. So I, I did a movement of a Brahms E flat. I think the first movement. I did the first movement of the Debian second sonata. Then I did a piece with a bunch of multiphonics and double tone. And then they wanted orchestral excerpts, which always cracked me up because there was no part of the job that was an orchestra at all. But I, I interviewed and through a, a, a series of, of really weird things, I got the job. Getting the interview was actually interesting because my clarinets at West Texas played at TMEA, and, and those were really good kids. And they played so well, and the guy who was the chair or the director of the School of Music at ASU was actually at that concert, and he came back and told the committee they missed somebody and they should interview me. So again, I went on the original list. So I, I ended up getting a job here, and and when I got to, to ASU, things were not r good. Um, Ron DeCant had left two years before and taken a lot of students with him, and they had an interim person, and that it was it was just a really weird scene. By the time I got there, I, I think there were seven students. So my boss it, it, it here gave me a five year ultimatum. I mean, like a five year plan, and he said, "You you have to have an internationally recognized studio in five years." But he said, "I'll help you." And it was it wasn't like this blind thing. I mean, he gave me money for recruiting. He gave me money for travel. I had meetings with him. He was the George Emerson. He was one of the greatest mentors because he set up meetings like every, once a month or twice a month. And he'd just sit down with coffee and he'd say, so what are you up to? And it was never any anything that, you know, oh, you have to do this, you have to do this. He, it was always, well, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? And, and George never said no. He always said, well, I don't think I can do that, but have you thought of this? He was amazing. So I started in 88. In 93, I, I was really disgusted with higher education. I mean, it, it, I was really upset with mandates that were being put on us by my upper administrators. And and, and it, it's like, the. I, I remember I was talking to Julie DeRoche once, and I said it was like the mandate du jour, you know, and the, the Soviet five-year wheat plan. You know, it was, it, was, it was getting to me. So I was going to go to law school. And uh, the dean of the assistant dean of law school or something came to one of my recitals. I'd already applied and everything. And she came to one of my recitals and she said, well, I'm going to go back and tear up your application because you're not leaving. So I decided to stay. But then at the same time, Dave Hickman owned Summit Records. And he said, we want you to get involved in doing some recordings. So I, I, I put together a list of people. They wanted a one composer recording. And I did this Joan Tower recording, which... Actually, it never really sold well. I mean, it probably sold 2,000 copies. But it got reviewed by, like, the Washington Post and all these 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 uh, New York Times, all these different things. And I got really good reviews on it. And so then that kind of opened up more doors. And when John Moeller retired from Michigan, he gave me all his music for clarinet and band. So what I decided to do was to put him to work and to recruit, record his music. And he came out and produced Dragon's Tongue for me, and, and that opened a lot of doors. And then Tarantella. And then in the same time, there was a, uh, I played the Tower Concerto with this orchestra in Columbus, Ohio, Pro Music Chamber Orchestra. And I really liked the orchestra. I liked the conductor. And the next year, they had a one-year opening. And the conductor called me, and he said, I know you don't like playing an orchestra. Would you like to come and play? I said, sure. So I went and played for a year, which turned into two years, which then... The union said I had to, I had to audition, so I did the audition, which was funny because I was contracted to record Copeland with him the next year, and so I got in, which was lucky, and I played with him for eighteen years, and that opened all sorts of doors. Not only my recording of Copeland, which is still played on, on NPR a lot, but but they commissioned Peter Shickley, Peter Kubak, to write a clarinet concerto for me, which is a, a, a beautiful piece. The unfortunate thing is that there's no piano reduction, so. It's only heard if somebody decides they want to do it with orchestra, and that means I think I'm probably the only one who ever played it. Um, but things at ASU continued to grow, and we were able at one point to add a second position. And for 11 years, it was Josh Gardner and, and me. Uh, before that, Jana Starling, and then before that, Jorge Montilla. And Josh and I uh, had a wonderful working relationship. And, uh, and it, 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 he, well... <laughs> I fixed him and his wife up. Uh, they, so I, but we had a wonderful working relationship, and we decided to teach in a different fashion and to team teach instead of 
-hmm. instead of two separate studios. So the kids would see me for four weeks and him for four weeks, and we'd just switch back and forth. Oh, that's cool. And, and it was actually really cool. We used to joke that you have to check your ego at the door because, you know, a lot of times you're saying something and somebody says, well, Dr. Gardner told me to do it this way. <laughs> okay. But it was it, it worked really well. And, and at the same time, the music making and the music commissioning and everything continued. And a, a gal who wrote at the University of Kentucky wrote her dissertation on me and the pieces that I had commissioned. And she came up with a list of, I don't know how many, a hundred or something. I was able to build the repertoire some. And I know a lot of them uh, are, you know, played a couple of times, but some of them have, have turned out to really get a life of their own. Um, I had a student a while ago who came, she, she came from the university of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee. And, and she came in one day and uh, she, I never met her. She auditioned by cassette tape, but she was a composition major. And I accepted her into the studio and she came in and she's a really sweet woman. And, and I asked her then to write me a couple of pieces along the way. And that's Teresa Martin. And, mm -hmm. and her music has done really well. Mm -hmm. And and so I feel I'm really proud of her as a person and I'm really proud of her as a composer. So it was, it was you know, able to do that. In 2023, the mandates du jour and uh, everything finally kind of hit me. And and I... I just decided that I, I really didn't want to be a part of stuff anymore. I just didn't have the love for it anymore. So I decided to retire. And then my boss asked me to, to stay a year and a half after that because of just to plan things out. And, and, um, and I did. Uh, I, I made a couple of deals that made life easier, like no committees and no faculty meetings. <laughs> And no evaluations. Uh, leaving was hard. We had a, a, a big party here, and uh, you were there, and there were, you know, like 160 former students. It was really fun. Going all the way back to 1979, and, and that was really kind of cool to know that you would had an impact on, on some, so many lives. Now I'm, I'm continuing to, to teach, uh, not here. Uh, I'm doing a lot of traveling. I, I, I just got back last night from, from South Dakota. I have a Former student Audrey Miller, who is the chair of a department and teaches clarinet at a university in Aberdeen, South Dakota, Northern State University, and I was up there for her band day and did some clinics for the kids and stuff. And and <laughs> I was supposed to play, but uh, the night before the first rehearsal, we went to dinner and I broke a tooth off, and it, the pain is pretty bad, so I didn't play. But I did do some teaching and gobbled lots of aspirin and s see the dentist on Monday. So it. it the life has been great. And, you know, I, I tell students, or told students, like it's past tense now, that that one of the things that, that, that always got me was my dad was worried about money. Would I make enough money? And the truth is that it now, at, at the end, when I'm retired, um, my retirement's great. I mean, I'm making more money than I did when I was teaching. And so that's spectacular. And the one thing was that I told my dad once, and, and this is when he changed. Uh, this, I said, "Dad, there are more important things than money," and and I remember at that point thinking, at that point in my career, how happy I was doing what I was doing. And I was getting paid to come in every day, and and help people be creative. It was our oboe teacher Martin Schuring that said something to me one day. I was I was complaining about going to juries. And, and I said, Martin, I hate juries. And he said, I really like them. I looked at him like, you know, you like being beat? <laughs> what, what, what is and he said, he said, no. He said, you know, I just sit there and think, boy, these students are being creative and they're doing all this stuff and it's really fun to hear. The other thing I changed during the, the last decade was that, uh, that I used to go to student recitals and write down comments about every piece so I could after the, 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 the lesson after their recital we could sit and talk about what they did right and what they did wrong I quit doing that because I realized I was treating the recital like a test instead of an opportunity for them to be creative and not be afraid and all of a sudden the recitals got a whole lot better and incredibly creative and then the kids started to do a lot of commissioning and you would have brand new pieces coming in and it was 
it was remarkable. And I never, I never would have saw that happening had Martin not said, you know, it, I love just listening to them be creative. You know, Bob, the world needs music more than ever. What would you tell your students in the future or future students about what they need to do to help the world become more connected to music? Well, as seen, regardless of which side of the coin you're on, we, we live in a very divided time, extremely divided time. And in my own family uh, with my brothers, um, you know, there are things you just can't talk about anymore because it's so divided. But the one thing that seems to unite everybody is a love of art. I think, you know, if you take two-year-old kids and you put them in a room that's painted white and you dump a box of crayons on the floor, they're going to color mm -hmm. because people, I think, have a need to be creative. And and, and I think that need con continues. And I think young people in particular have to have the ability to continue to express themselves in get these these emotions out without continuing to bottle things in. So I, th I think like music education, I was telling the, the students up in South Dakota, this is probably the most important time in my lifetime for kids to be involved in music because it's something that bridges the gap with everybody. The other thing, I one of my brothers, who, who was a music major actually, uh, he was a trumpet player and then left music, is now back playing with a brass band in southern Michigan, and all of these people, they're doctors and lawyers and accountants and former teachers, all these people are involved in making music and doing something beautiful together, regardless of the, the politics or, the, or their feelings about anything. I, I think the arts are more important than ever. I think that that, that that could be the thing that finally brings us all together one way or another. So uh, we took my, my daughter and, and son-in-law to London and, and, and uh, to England and Scotland about six weeks ago. And we went to the British Museum. And you walk into that one room with uh, the Egyptian antiquities, these huge statues. Nobody's talking about the politics. Well, they may be talking about this emperor or that emperor. But what they're doing is they're looking at this art mm -hmm. and just sitting there and staring at it. There were so many people you could barely move in there. Mm -hmm. And they're all looking at this art that was made thousands and thousands of years ago we that's what we talk about so i'm hoping in the future that what we talk about is is the art and not the political turmoil we go through and and with that being said i just think that that the way to do that is to get more and more people involved in some kind of art activity and i, I think music is the one that every, every school has a high school band every school they don't all have orchestras but they all have a high school band and a choir and getting people involved is really important. Then, like in Tempe, there are two community bands. Mm -hmm. And all these people are playing in these community bands, and they're making music together. And, and it's not just the aesthetics of it, but it's also the social fabric and creating something that's unified as opposed to something that's, that's fighting each other all the time. Mm -hmm. If somebody was listening to this po podcast and was inspired by your story, what would you tell them right now to get them to decide to play a wind instrument? The benefits are unbelievable. Being a part of, of, of an ensemble, like, like a community band or, or something like that, where you're a part of a group, there's nothing like that. The feeling you get when, when everybody's playing together and everybody's working toward a common goal is, is mind-boggling. I played with a lot of community bands through the years, and there are all sorts of people, doctors, lawyers, like I said, accountants, all working together to do something. In high school and, and junior high, I know it's supposed to be simply aesthetic education, but it's not. I mean, there are also times when you, you see kids that that don't fit in anywhere else that all of a sudden fit in a band, and mm -hmm. they're a part of a group and part of something really important. I think it's the aesthetics of it, that's one thing, but getting the emotional feel. But the other thing is just being a part of something that's bigger than you will ever be. I mean, if you look back in clarinet music, I mean, if you think of all the masterworks and all the incredible players through the years and performers and teachers, you can be part of that, part of that whole tree of life, a tree of musical life. I think that's really important. I think it's important to belong to something, belong to something that's greater than you are. And you don't have to be very good at it to participate. All you have to do is no. want to try. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why those New Horizons bands are doing so well. 
-hmm. because these people really want to do something again and make beautiful music. Thank you. 